At the federal level, the functions of the executive branch pertain to both domestic and foreign policy. I've already explained how I think uh, government in general should be greatly decentralized stateside with a focus on county rights first, then states, and then very limited federal instrument. In other words, true federalism. Now, for this reason, we don't have to really discuss here how we were once free in these regards because we've already largely described it in other areas. We've also already covered most of the fall into tyranny in that regard, particularly with welfare and taxation, the military, etc. And so we'll reserve comments on those regards also, uh, but instead focus on the two most dangerous state sides issue, the abuses of executive orders and administrative law. And these will appear, of course, in the next section. Domestic and foreign policy are separate areas, but hardly have separable consequences in many ways. And in this regard, we'll discuss the loss of freedom in regard to the president's enumerated power to sign treaties, a power which is checked only partially by the legislative branch. And to this power, Americans have always been, and remain to this day, vulnerable to tyranny by foreign entanglements. And this will also appear in the next section. Lord Acton is credited with the famous saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. A corollary to this is to say the closer you get to absolute power, the more the potentials and temptations of corruption increase as well. Solutions to the various problems of society appear more within reach when viewed through the scope of comprehensively armed and funded coercive apparatus at your fingertips. And thus, the larger and more centralized the executive institution becomes, the more tempting it becomes to bypass clumsy Congress and the lumbering judiciary and instead administer as extensively as possible via executive decree alone. And as soon as the executive tastes the efficiency of government by decree, like sharks with blood, it goes crazy for more. For these reasons, along with their colonial experiences of abuse, Americans were especially wary of a strong executive power, too much like a monarch. In fact, among those grievances we've highlighted previously in the Declaration of Independence, all were charges against King George, the executive, who had trampled the colony's rights in all other areas of legislation and courts. He had abused his executive power with the colonies uh, and was refusing them the rights of representation and due process promised them as citizens under English common law. The, precur the precursor to the Declaration of Independence was the Declaration of Rights of 1774. It complained of being governed by, quote, unconstitutional powers. And this in particular was in reference to the Parliament but the point was that Britain and her colonies were supposed to be governed by laws, and the laws should apply equally to the rulers as to the people. Laws stand over the government, not the government over the laws. It is this principle which is broken the moment the executive power is defined too broadly or given too much power otherwise. Such a powerful central executive is one of the many points of controversy during our own constitutional debates. Opponents feared the figure would be no different, essentially, uh, than the monarch from whose tyranny they had just bought freedom themselves. America had done, uh, had some history of dealing with corruption and autocratic state governors, like the Dinwiddie in Virginia, and these were often bad enough. But now the Constitution was threatening to create just such an office at the national level. At the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, Edmund Randolph, who was the governor of Virginia at that time, and later would be Secretary of State for a year and a half under Washington, argued that the executive power should not be vested in one man, but rather at least three. And he, along with many others, criticized a unity in the executive as too close to creating a king. Responding to those whom he thought desired to mimic the British government, he called the presidency the fetus of monarchy. This was a major theme throughout the anti-federalist writings during the ratification era. One writing under the name of an old Whig expressed the feelings of those who feared the great centralization of power to be vested in a single person in the executive. He said, quote, 
In the first place, the office of President of the United States appears to me to be clothed with such powers as are dangerous. To be the fountain of all honors in the United States, commander of chief in, in chief of the Army, Navy, and Militia, with the power of making treaties and granting pardons, and to be vested with an authority to put a negative upon all laws, unless two-thirds of both houses shall persist in enacting it, and put their names down upon calling the yeas and nays for that purpose, is in reality to be a king as much a king as the king of Great Britain. Such power, old Whig continued, would be a great temptation to corruption, even to the point of seizing indefinite power and refusing to relinquish it. All that would stand in the way of such a corruption is the want of unprecedented character. Quote, it will cost a man many struggles to resign such eminent powers, and before long we shall find someone who will be very unwilling to part with them. So far is it from its being improbable that the man who shall hereafter be in situation to make the attempt to, per to perpetuate his own power should want the virtues of George Washington. That it is perhaps a chance of 100 millions to one that the next age will not furnish an example of so disinterested a use of great power. As we have seen, not even Washington was so disinterested as old Whig here assumes. And while such refusal to leave the office has yet occurred, uh, or has not yet occurred, it is safe to say that the abuse uh, of the great power for self-interest and party interest is abundantly enough documented as to make the old Whig's prediction too accurate. One of the chief proponents of the one-man executive view was James Wilson of Pennsylvania a prominent influential lawyer who later served as one of the Supreme Court justices originally. His arguments hold some merit as far as they would have been applicable. He thought a single person executive would force transparency and accountability. He said, quote, the executive power is better to be trusted when it has no screen. Sir, we have a responsibility in the person of our president. He cannot act improperly and hide either his negligence or inattention. He cannot roll upon any other person the weight of his criminality. No appointment can take place without his nomination, and he is responsible for every nomination he makes. Now, this might have been great had the executive ever truly been designed and run literally only by one person. But some of Washington's earliest presidential deeds were to create a cabinet with positions of delegated responsibility. These provided the very screen of which Wilson warned. And yet, by the way, Wilson, a strong nationalist, never decried them after the fact. Hamilton, as we've talked about, was a notable screen. His agenda was essentially uh, 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 fronted by George Washington. And this was all within one year of Wilson's persuasions. Today, the executive branch has dozens of levels of bureaucracy, cabinet positions, and things like that. Literally millions of employees, all of whom can and do provide screens for irresponsibility, for corruption, for waste, things like that, throughout many different levels. Another anti-federalist warned about what has turned out to be a real danger of the president. That is, his actual job description for executing the law. This appears in Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution, and it is left extremely broad, not an uncommon feature of the Constitution. Quote, he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. In a letter to Captain Peter Osgood of Massachusetts, William Sims described the problem. Quote, can we exactly say how far a faithful execution of the laws may extend? or what may be called or comprehended in such a faithful execution. If the president be guilty of a misdemeanor, will he not take care to have this excuse? And should it turn against him, may he not plead a mistake? Or is he bound to understand the laws or their operation? Should a federal law happen to be as generally expressed as the president's authority, uh, must he not interpret the act? For in many cases, he must execute the laws independent of any judicial decision. And should the legislature direct the mode of executing the laws, or any particular law, is he obligated to comply if he does not think it will amount to a faithful execution? In other words, the Constitution defines the president's power so broadly that he can essentially create new laws by interpreting undefined areas of existing law according to his own agenda. 
interpreting how to implement existing laws, or he can perhaps even ignore specific laws of Congress if he deems them to infringe upon the broad interpretation that he comes up with. In this way, the president has great latitude under the guise of his, quote, care to faithfully execute the laws. Now compare this recipe for confusion and tyranny with the biblical function of the executive power. Here's the famous Romans 13 passage, and it's very helpful in its simplicity. Concerning the magistrate, quote, He is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. The executive power's function is not to make the laws, nor to interpret the laws, nor to judge cases at law, but rather to apply punishments and enforce the laws. And note two things. First, the making of laws must be already established before enforcement can legitimately be done. There must never be a time in which the executive feels free to create laws itself and then enforce those laws. If such a new law needs to be created, it must go through the legislative process. And in the meantime, the sword must not be used to enforce such a dubious law. Secondly, in a society governed by laws, the punishments themselves must be prescribed by law. The use of the sword itself must be predictable. Only that which the Bible says is punishable should be punished, and that which is punished should only be punished according to the principles laid down in Scripture. Both of these reasons taken together derive from the principle that the executive power is itself subject to the law both in what it enforces and in how it enforces it. The executive at every level of government is a man under authority and must be made to behave accordingly. This is why the laws for the kings, which we've reviewed previously in Deuteronomy 17, state that the king must make himself a copy of the law and read in it daily. He must know exactly what he is empowered to do, what he's not empowered to do, and what he's explicitly forbidden to do. The law itself, in other words, should restrict the executive's care that the laws be faithfully executed. In the biblical system, the supreme executive is obvious. He is God. The powers that be in whatever executive systems we enlist on earth must all rule in God's service, according to God's law, according to God's facts, and must punish only according to God's revealed standards of punishment and restitution. In fact, God must be the head of all of our branches of government. Quoting from Isaiah uh, 13, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Isaiah 33, actually. The biblical executive is a ministry accountable to God, not a demigod which has the people accountable to it. And as we shall see, the executive of the United States is today a long way from this simple biblical model. In the next section, we'll see several ways in which the president has abused his care and his other powers.